What you just saw is a great demonstration of the importance of aerodynamics in cycling. It shows that adjusting your posture on the bike can sometimes be more effective than pedaling. Since the 90s, there have been many attempts to come up with the ultimate position for descending. Riders tried to be creative. Some were more effective than others, as shown by a group of scientists from Belgium in this research. Chris Froome's famous descending position is slower than Marco Pantani's iconic style, but they both lag behind the super tuck that was invented by Matej Maharic, which is 17% faster than a regular position. He's sitting on the top tube. I've never seen anything like it. Still, none of the above stands a chance against this one. On this descent, this rider and the rest of the group were going at exactly the same speed before he transitioned into what cycling fans call the Superman position, and it did magic. This extremely aerodynamic position allowed him to descend 24% faster than the rest. He streamlined himself to drastically reduce his frontal area, which consequently reduced the amount of air friction and allowed him to pick up speed from the gravitational force on this descent. In this case, a speed that wouldn't be achievable by just pedaling. However, this posture and many others, including the Super Tuck, have been banned from professional racing by the UCI since April 2021. Wind. It can either be your best ally or your worst enemy. On stage 13 of the 2016 Tour de France, photographer Joris Knappen shot one of the wildest photos in cycling. It shows Julian Alaphilippe flying in the air, six feet above the ground, something you don't see every day. The French rider was time trialing at the speed of 52 kilometers per hour when a wind gust blew him off the road, lifted him into the air, and threw him against a rocky cliffside. It was a horrible scene. Miraculously, the Frenchman got up unharmed and continued on his race. He only suffered a cut on his thumb and a few bruises on his shoulder and back. In the post-race interview, Julian said, the wind caught me. I did not expect to take a gust like that. It took me to the outside of the turn and I went straight into the rocks. This remains one of the weirdest and most unbelievable shots ever taken in cycling. Road cyclists are more known for their endurance capabilities and less for their bike handling skills, but there are exceptions. When a road cyclist comes from a different field, like cyclocross or mountain biking, where he's required to constantly adjust to varying terrains, he usually brings with him a variety of skill sets. Skills that make the difference at crucial moments. Fernando Gaviria is the fastest, without doubt, out of these few riders. On the left-hand side, Nasser Wani as Gaviria goes down. In the 2016 Milan San Remo, a touch of wheels sent Fernando Gaviria to the ground in the home straight. On his wheel, Peter Sagan shows incredible reflexes that are really hard to catch in real speed. With no time to think, his instinct, being a former mountain biker, intervened. Having strong neural pathways and muscle memory allowed him to dodge Gaviria's left leg by just a few centimeters with a reaction time of around 150 milliseconds, which is way below the average person's reaction time, estimated at 215 milliseconds. The same could be said about Fabian Cancellara, although instead of solely relying on his body reflexes, he used his brakes masterfully to avoid the fallen rider. Where is Peter Sagan? I don't see him, baby. He's this is another example of Peter's elite bike handling skills. He lost balance on this slippery corner, but he quickly unclipped and used his foot against the ground to regain balance. He always look at this now because Sagan pulled his foot off the wheel as he come off that bed. And it didn't prevent him from winning the race a few seconds later. And he looks at Obey, took his leading towards the line here. 
50 meters go, another silly bend before the line, and it looks to me as though Saga, Saga gets it. The photo finish invention was a great solution to distinguish the winner of a race when the simple eye or a regular camera can't. After hundreds of kilometers of racing, one pixel could be the difference between winning and losing. I've been in a few photo finishes myself. Sometimes I've been on the wrong end of a pixel, you could say. Just like in this photo from the 2017 Tour de France, the difference between the two riders was no more than six millimeters which corresponds to three milliseconds in time, according to the officials, the closest margin in the history of the race. But there's always something strange about this type of image. The first thing you may notice is the curved spokes and the weird looking road surface. In order to explain these strange artifacts, let's first try to get a general understanding of how a photo finish image is taken. Normal cameras catch what's in front of the sensor at a particular moment in time. The result is an image that's thousands of pixels in width and height. But a photo finish is a result of a completely different process. A particular type of camera is used to capture thousands of frames per second. Each frame is one pixel in width and thousands of pixels in height. Each vertical slice was captured at a different point in time from the next one to it. A computer software program compiles all these frames together to create a photo finish. When you're looking at it, you're seeing the progression of that one pixel wide frame through time. The bikes and the riders riding them usually look normal, but the spokes look curved because the wheels would be spinning as they cross the finish line. And because the road is stationary and it's being captured on every frame, the resulting image shows a stretched background. It's the penultimate stage of the 2002 Tour Down Under. A 21-year-old Michael Rogers has managed to get himself into a strong breakaway group in the hope of getting the race's overall lead. Look at that. The yellow jersey is at six minutes. It's all over for Fabio. In so far, his plan was working very well until one of the in-race motorcycles destroyed his bike in a collision. Michael Rogers has thrown his bike to the ground he desperately needs one quick he's got one it's not a team bike although it's the same make as his team colnago and i have a feeling that's come from a spectator rogers slams it to the ground in frustration knowing that the replacement bike will not be arriving anytime soon but a fan from the side of the road showed up with a bike and offered it to rogers who hopped on it without hesitation to get back into the race that in itself is unheard of in professional racing but this is the strange part about this story. Out of thousands of other possibilities, Roger's original bike and the one he borrowed from the side of the road were identical in almost every aspect. Except for the custom paint job, the two bikes share the same manufacturer, same module and same size, and it came with compatible pedals as well. What's even more mind-boggling about this is that Adam Pike, to whom the bike belongs, happened to be at the perfect location on that 156 kilometers long stage where Rogers had the mechanical problem. What are the possibilities? And there's uh, always been an admirer of Michael Rogers and Rogers is still sprinting on this bike. At least he knows now his bike goes because that was the sprint and a very valuable three second bonus. Rogers made a comeback that day overtaking the breakaway group and finishing second with enough time advantage to claim the race lead. And Michael Rogers is making sure he's got the race lead because he's getting a second place win bonus as well. So that will give him a clear lead overall and it's all been done on a borrowed bicycle today. He ended up winning the Tour Down Under the next day. He met with Adam after that stage and both were interviewed to tell the story on live television. At first glance, it looks like one of those video game glitches. Some jokingly said that the wheel sunk into a patch of quicksand. But this image is not fake. Taken by photographer Christian Hartmann at the end of stage four of the 2010 tour of Switzerland, this photo shows a moment before disaster. 
Renshaw trying to set Cavendish up for the win. It's a headwind finish. He can't go too early as Lagutin goes on the left-hand side. Cavendish bounces out of here. Chilek's going to go for it. Cavendish goes in the middle. Cavendish goes for the line. Is he going to get this one? Oh, it's a massive crash on the finish line. Hausler goes down. Cavendish goes down. Pataki takes the win, but they're all... HTC's Mark Cavendish was going head-to-head -head with his rival, Henrik Hausler, in the sprint when their front wheels touched at well over 65 kilometers per hour. Look at this, Cavendish and Hausler, there's nowhere to go. They just lean on each other and Cavendish at maybe 40 miles an hour. Both went down in front of a charging pack of riders, resulting in a massive pile-up. Hausler's wheel rode up on Cavendish's wheel, causing it to fold up but it snapped back into shape in less than half a second. In that moment, this shot was taken. In the slow motion replay, the carbon fiber wheel seemed to spin normally, but it wasn't rideable after undergoing such deformation. The overhead shot shows both riders moved laterally towards each other, but Cavendish's movement was more dangerous. The race jury decided to fine him, Lucky for him, he escaped with small cuts, but Hausler had to abandon with a deep cut to his arm that required hospital treatment.